Hi, everybody, and welcome to Life Bulb Live. Today, we're going to be having an interesting conversation. It's going to be about growing up with a chronic illness. Um, Karin, I know that you just said that you were diagnosed at 16. I did not get my diagnosis until adulthood. And our ambassador, Celia, who's also part of our team, was diagnosed at birth. So this should be a really interesting conversation. Celia, thank you so much for being part of our um, little chat here today. Yeah. Welcome, Celia. Nice Hi. to meet you. Can you tell us a little bit about your diagnosis and when you were diagnosed, all that good stuff? <laughs> she is too young to. I know. Sure. Do you have a well, memory can... of that? Yeah, I don't have any memory, but I, I know the story pretty well. Um, so I was born um, with a condition called Hirschsprung's disease, which affects the growth of nerves in the large and small intestine. And I had a pretty severe case of it. So uh, at day one of life, um, I would not eat and I threw up meconium and that meant that they knew there was some sort of blockage. So um, by day one, I had a complete uh, disconnect from my colon and about half my small intestine. So I've spent, I've lived my whole life with short bowel syndrome, which is basically when you remove some of the intestine and I have about half of my small intestine and that's how I've lived my entire life. Um, and I've relied on IV nutrition my whole life. So I have had a central line and I have an ostomy. So you, were di you weren't diagnosed, like your mother didn't find out in utero. You, it was after no. you were born that she found out. It was after I was born, yeah. And I mean, throwing up that, I know you won't remember it, but that black junk that comes out, oh my goodness, that must've yes. been so scary for your family. Yes, my parents were both in grad school um, and they basically had this baby that they thought was going to be pretty okay, manageable. And then I spent the first month of my life in the hospital and my parents had to drive back and forth every day to uh, come be with me. Um, you know, and I think we were really lucky. The team that I had at the time was really great. And that's actually the team that I had from birth to 11 when we moved to Maryland, because I grew up oh, in wow. Southern California. I had that team and I've known that team my whole life and we're really close. The doctor and nurse that like diagnosed me and taught my parents how to take care of me are like second family to me. Um, you know, it's when you spend your entire See life going to doctor's appointments twice a month, like it's just a part of your family. <laughs> yeah, Celia, just to put it in perspective, how many uh, births a year uh, does this, I mean, how many young babies does this affect every year in the US? I don't know the exact data, but it's definitely in the rare, rare <laughs> of things. Um, I don't know the exact Ultra numbers orphan. off the top of my head. Yeah. yeah, I did Google it and I couldn't find much information about it no. because it must be that. Yeah, and I mean, I. The, the other thing is that most people with Hirschsprungs have, um, it's a condition that can affect a lot of different, in a, like it's a, a sliding scale. And so I have a very uh, like strong case of it. So a lot of people have it, they deal with it at a young age, they fix it and it's not a big deal after that. Yeah, one in 5,000 births. I was one of the rare cases where they had to do a lot more and it, it impacted me for the rest of my life. It's yeah. pretty impressive that you're that you stayed so close with those doctors. I think that says a lot about the doctors your family chose and, you know, your connection to them. Yeah. I mean, I think we were really lucky where we were and the hospital team and everything, but I think also just part of growing up with a condition means that especially in pediatrics, if you're seeing the same doctor. I mean, I went to the doctor probably once, twice to three times a month every month for the first 15 years of my life. So wow. for me, that experience, you just, it becomes as much as seeing a teacher every day, as much as seeing anyone in your life all the time. They're, you know, most people, they go to the doctor once a year, twice a year. My connection with doctors is so close because of just regularly seeing them that it became normal for me uh, as if they were another part of my day-to-day yeah. -day life. Right. I mean, this is what we hear hear a lot. I mean, in the successful cases, and you're clearly a successful case. Uh, you know, we hear that that uh, patients and doctors stay very close uh, when you're diagnosed yep. at childhood. 
uh, you know, the difficulties are probably more when you transition from pediatric care to adult care and yeah. you have to switch doctors and, and you're no longer yeah. in that cocoon of uh, friendliness and team and, uh, and now you're suddenly in the adult setting. So, you know, in your case, Absolutely. did that happen at college or when, when did that happen that you transitioned? So I had two big transitions in my life. So um, when I was 11, I moved from Southern California to Maryland for my parents' work. Um, and having to adjust to a new hospital team was really difficult for me because of how close my relationship yeah. was before I moved. I and having a really rare condition means that very few doctors know what to do with me. And so I had a mm. lot of doctors. I went through a couple different hospital situations where I was the most complicated case in their patient list. Yeah. And so they were stretching to take care of me. They were having to do research to figure out how to take care of me. And I got very sick because they didn't know the best way to take care of me. And oh. um, it took a while to find a hospital that would manage my case long term. And that eventually happened. And then, you know, when I, so I, it took, I really didn't want to let go of my pediatric team then because of, I knew how bad that situation had gotten. So then when I was in 2021, um, I was very hesitant about switching. Um, one issue was that I needed, I was an adult and pediatrics can't take care of adults on perp. There's a reason that you need to change. But the other thing was that I, um, in 2014, had a case of, I had a central line infection which went into full uh, sepsis and I went into septic shock and I was in a coma for 10 days. And um, in that process- How old were you? How old were you, Celia, when that I happened? Was 18. I was 18 wow. when that happened. And, and um, I was on break from my first semester of college and I was, all my organs failed. I had to be on dialysis. It was an extreme, you know, very intense hospitalization. I was hospitalized for about a month. And in that time, after that, they were like, you have to go be in adult care. You're, you're being tell taken care of with pediatrics, but that was, that was the last situation. You're now an adult. And um, that was a really hard transition. I, I had to change hospitals because the, the team that I used to be with, that was the adult team, didn't want to work with my condition. And, you know, I was told, in fact, that I would say they didn't want to take on my case because I was a liability. They were worried I was going to die. So they were like, we don't want your case. Please leave. Um, and, you know, finding a new hospital, finding that all of that was really complicated. And also um, the sepsis kind of woke me up. You know, I spent my whole life having this condition. It didn't really feel like it was a big deal. I didn't really look at other people and go, man, I wish I had their lives because it was just my health. It felt like my right. body. It felt normal. Um, but the sepsis was the first time that was really, really sick. And so that kind of woke up this new sense of, oh, wow, I don't, what is my life now? What is this? Did you, did me? you know other uh, patients as you were growing up who also had that short bowel syndrome? That was going to be my question. <laughs> yes. Yes, I did. Um, there is a amazing foundation called the Oli Foundation, um, which connects patients on parenteral and enteral nutrition which I've been on my entire life. Um, and I've been going to those regularly, they have a yearly conference. And I've gone to those off and on throughout my life, but pretty much the last six years I've gone every year. And it isn't, I, I will say that I've developed friendships in the last four years. So at the time of my, my extreme uh, health issues, I did not have any friends. But yeah. something that has really benefited my mental health and really benefited my health situation is that I now have some of my best friends have ostomies, have are on TPN, and that just like makes everything about my life so much easier. <laughs> because you, you said initially that you never knew anything different. Uh, you yes. you always were had this syndrome, and you 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 essentially were born with it. But yes. you were still in normal school. And yeah. you saw all your friends who did not have ostomies and did not need nutrition this way. So, this you know, how, how did that make you feel? Karen is right was... in my head today because that's exactly what I, where I was going. I'm curious about the friends and, you know, feeling that way. When I was a really little kid, it didn't really bother me. In fact, I think I, I think I definitely showed my central line for show and tell one day like i just like fully like pulled out my line and was like here's my show and tell it's my line um 
And, but I think in middle school, I suddenly realized, like I had just moved, I was in a new school, it's middle school, everyone knows middle school is the worst school. And I just realized I didn't want to be different than everybody else. So I hit it completely. Uh, at the time, low cut jeans were in style and like very low cut tops. And I couldn't wear those because my line and ostomy, but I would try to wear them and then just like pull them up like all day long. And I didn't want anyone to know. And it wasn't until I think college that I started to like reopen up and realize that it was okay for people to know and that no one cared. But, you know, I didn't have to, I infused my nutrition at night. So during the day, I tried to hide that I was different as much as possible. But you didn't eat. I do eat. I eat a regular diet. I just don't absorb. Yeah, I so absorb you eat, but it doesn't do anything for you. Yeah, exactly. So I get most, I get my nutrition at oh, night gosh. and then I eat during the day and that kind of helps me uh, get through the day. So I, I looked normal, but um, I wasn't. <laughs> Yeah. Did did you have like a resistance from friends? Like, did people did people accept you as that, or did you feel? Because I mean, you're right. Middle school is really hard, and to be different is you know, it's difficult I, for teens. I think I I don't think I gave people the choice to be um, oh, I love that. accepting because I took my I was so scared of people rejecting me that I didn't allow like I I kept myself back. I didn't make right. a lot of deep friendships in middle school and high school. And at the time I was like, there's just no cool people. And looking back, I know that I was absolutely just holding myself away from everyone. I didn't want anyone to get too close because I didn't pe want people to see my room that had all my medical supplies everywhere. I didn't want people seeing any of that stuff. Yeah, you, um, you told yourself you don't need them. Exactly, I was like, I'm fine. I've got my parents, I've got my doctors. <laughs> I don't, you know, I had a, a friend from birth, like, so when I was, my parents had really close friends who had a baby about a month before me. And so we grew up as best friends. I had a built in best friend. And um, so she was there the whole time. So she knew everything, you know, when she was four, I was four, when we would have like a blow up pool in the backyard, my line would be out and she didn't know any different. She didn't so know I basically different. was just like, I'll just keep her and I don't need anybody else. Um, you know, <laughs> in the yeah. very teenager method of this is the only way I don't want to, don't let anyone in. I don't want to deal with anything, you know? And I think that's been so beneficial of being an adult is that I can now not only process, you know, letting people in, but also recognizing that like, things that I used to think were just part of my health condition are actually anxiety and actually depression. And like, I should go, I should act like see a therapist and talk about my health condition and not just assume that because it's part of my whole life that I'm fine. Right. You know, well, you know, we're talking about growing up and I'm curious the way you're describing things, were you, were your parents really, um, helpful in teaching you how to do everything like making you proactive in your own health because yes. you the way you're talking really seems like you you you're not old so you're still kind of growing up um yeah. as am i at 50 uh, not 50 yet but anyways uh, did you did you have this grasp on it so that the transition did make it easier yeah i've been taking care of myself i mean you know when you have an ostomy that's going to the bathroom that is the only, you have to learn how to, like my parents were like, you can't not go to the bathroom at someone's house. You have to know how to do that. So from right. as, er, you know, when they potty trained other, when other kids were getting potty trained, they taught me how to use my ostomy and how to change it. And I've been, you know, doing like central line accessing since I was 12. Um, so those types of things have been really important. My parents knew like right off the bat, they were like, we're gonna make sure that when she, she's got it all covered, um, which I think has been hugely important because I am, in, I'm very capable of going out into the world and doing things because I don't have to have a caretaker with me or anything like right. that because I know how to do everything. I mean, the fact that your parents were both in graduate school when you were diagnosed, they were probably very into studying, into doing research. Yes. Uh, you know. My dad always jokes. So my dad was in, <laughs> my dad was getting his master's degree in music composition because my dad is a musician. Um, 
my mom, on the other hand, was getting her master's and then eventual PhD in Latin American political science. So wow. <laughs> my dad always jokes that when I was born, he laid next to me and watched me while my mom went into full research mode in the <laughs> medic hospital, like medical library. And they, she was like, bring me everything that mentions anything my daughter could possibly have anything. And they just, she took all of her like writing my dissertation and put it into how do I take care of my daughter with a chronic illness? <laughs> yeah. That's, that's incredible. Cause it is a lot. I mean, my son was premature. It's clearly not even a fraction of the same thing. And just having him in that hospital, you know, my first son, and you know, sure. as a parent, that's really scary to have your kid go through that. So it's, yeah. it, I mean, I researched premature, you know, premature births, but you know, to be able to dive into it like that, you have no choice as a, as a parent. Yeah. Um, yeah. So my question is going to be this mm -hmm. too. And I hope it's not, you know, what has dating been like as a young adult and growing up like this? Is that hard? Is it, yeah. you know, you see, you're so, you're so okay, but you know, that's, mm -hmm. that's a difficult avenue no matter what. Yeah. No, I mean, I think I, I like all of middle school and high school was just like, I can't do that because no one will get it. Um, you know, and I've, I've dated off and on, um, and it was really difficult. It was really difficult to open up. And often I pulled back and like ran away from situations. And I was like, they don't actually like me because they don't actually know me. Um, you know, I'm really lucky right now. I'm in a relationship. Um, he's an EMT, which works out really nice. Oh, because he, un <laughs> he understands all the stuff, um, which is really convenient. And he's a friend that I've had. I've actually known him through middle school and high school. Um, and we like reconnected as we got older. Um, and I think he has said, he's like, I did not know any of this in high school. And I was like, wow. oh, you, I was not going to allow anyone to know any of this in high school. And, you know, wow. um, but dating is really hard. And I know a lot of patients who have the same condition as me who are like, I will never date. It's just not in the cards for me. I don't, no one's going to get it. You know, I have having major, uh, they've removed all of, about, you know, one and a half of my intestine, intestinal organs. Um, I have a large scar across my stomach and like that is scary to open up and be okay with the differences the, the way you look and the differences and way things work it's really hard to like open that up and be okay and be vulnerable um you know i'm in a relationship but it's still really hard all the time <laughs> I, I totally understand that and i, I know karen we both have talked about scars a lot and i think you know i'm older so i it, i've accepted them a little bit more but the you're younger and i think our society you know has this picture of what a woman's body should look like or a man's body whichever and yeah. we don't fit that mold and that can be really difficult yeah. especially with young I, I mean i have a lot of um you know iv port placements in my chest because they use my main veins um and i've had i had someone once come up to me and ask if i had been burned by cigarettes because wow. I had these dots all over my chest. Right. And I was like, no. Uh, and then immediately they were like, do you have cancer? And I was like, no, I don't. <laughs> Just out of curiosity, Celia, what kind of, is that a random person or is that a friend? No, that's a random person that just yeah, saw so me what, with a low cut I mean, that, to, me, and... to me, I mean, I, I'm so much not as nice as you are. I, I think that would be a, a very easy uh, you know, response back to them. What that's not their business at all. You know, and 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 talking to you that way, you know, essentially assuming that you've been abused, uh, right? And also, uh, that I it's, talk it's, about it's funny it. how people meddle, right? Yeah, it's very yeah. bizarre the, the comments yeah. that are made. <laughs> Every now and again, some people gross. care, and that's some the way they care. care. Some yeah. people, you know, look at my scars and they think that I have cancer and they have a story to share about their loved one that has cancer. Yeah. And that's really beautiful. And then I feel really bad that I don't have cancer because I'm like, <laughs> so sorry. I can't share my story with you. I'm you know, so most of the time, most of the time people want to talk about themselves. Yes. So they see an opening for something that is somewhat similar and then yeah. they can talk about their own issue, uh, yes. you know, because mm -hmm. most people are selfish. And that's, that's all they want to talk true. about. <laughs> and they say, the oh, there's a connection it. here. Now I can talk yeah. about my story. It is interesting. Right. You know, I, I care. I, you know, I connect to IV fluids. I regularly have to run them during the day now um, to stay hydrated. And I wear them in a backpack. And sometimes my line will show in an outfit more than others. Like most of the time, it's just 
you know, underneath my shirt, no big deal. But every now and again, I'm wearing a cute top and it shows a little bit more. And I will get stares, a lot of stares when I go grocery shopping, you know, I'll have people and I'll be like, why is that woman glaring at me? And then I'll like process and I'll be like, oh, she was staring at my thing. Gotcha. You know, and, and um, it's weird. <laughs> yeah, I don't know exactly know what to do about it, but you just sort of, you know, you get kind of used you to it. You just roll with it. Mm -hmm. So Celia, if you could tell somebody who is, you know, young going through this, what's, sure. what's one beautiful tip that you would give somebody who's growing up with a chronic illness? Maybe they're a teenager or they're 11 or 12 years old. What, what is something that you've learned through this? I would say um, that I recommend like you need to make sure your support network is there and you need to rely on it um you know i've been really lucky i have a really large family and so even when i was didn't want to like let in friends i had this family that i could re rely on mm -hmm. but as i've gotten older opening myself up to friends opening myself up to friends with chronic illness like finding the people that are gonna be there for me that are my support system is so important um and asking for help because I think part of being a person with a chronic illness and wanting to be independent all the time is that I got really bad about letting people help me. I wanted to be independent. I didn't need any help. I got it. Don't worry about it. I got it. Don't don't try to help me. And it got to a point where I realized I forgot that I, I didn't know how to ask for help anymore. And um, that's not great. That's a great people want to help advice. each other. Yeah. yeah. Don't really be afraid of asking, asking for help and don't, yes. uh, don't try to do this alone. Especially yes, as absolutely. a team, because you do want to be independent and, you know, yes. forge your way. So yeah. thank you so much, Celia, for joining us today and having this conversation. <laughs> I think you know, you're so eloquent in what you're in, in how you deliver yourself and um, your parents must be incredibly proud and you should be proud of yourself too. And, <laughs> and we're, we're so really happy to have, to have you as our part of the life ball team. Celia. I love being part of the life ball team. <laughs> we love having you here. Yeah. Thank you so much. Right. Everyone have a beautiful day. Yes.